Hello and welcome back and welcome to part two of my reading for Christmas of A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. This is the second chapter, otherwise known as Stave Two. Stave Two, the first of the three spirits. When Scrooge awoke it was dark, so dark that looking out of the window he could barely distinguish the transparent window from the opaque walls of his chamber. He was endeavouring to pierce the darkness with his ferret eyes when the chimes of a neighbouring church struck the four quarters. So he listened for the hour. To his great astonishment, the heavy bell went on from six to seven, and from seven to eight, and regularly up to twelve, then stopped. Twelve! It was past two when he went to bed. The clock was wrong. An icicle must have got into the works. Twelve! He touched the spring of his repeater to correct this most preposterous clock. Its rapid little pulse beat twelve and stopped. Why, it isn't possible, said Scrooge, that I can have slept through a whole day and far into another night. It isn't possible that anything has happened to the sun, and this is twelve at noon. The idea being an alarming one, he scrambled out of bed and groped his way to the window. He was obliged to rub the frost off of the sleeve of his dressing gown before he could see anything at all, and then he could see very little. All he could make out was that it was still very foggy and extremely cold, that there was no noise of people running to and fro and making a great stir, as there unquestionably would have been if night had been beaten off by bright day and taken possession of the world. This was a great belief, great relief because three days after the sight of this first of ch a check, first exchange, pay to Mr. Ribnick's and the Scrooge on, on his order, and so forth, would have become a mere United States security if there was no days to count by. Scrooge went to bed again and thought and thought and thought it over and could make nothing of it. The more he thought, the more perplexed he was, and the more he endeavoured not to think, the more he thought. Marley's ghost bothered him exceedingly, Every time he resolved within himself, after mature inquiry, that it was all a dream, his mind flew back again like a strong spring released to its first position, and presented the same problem to he worked all through. Was it a dream, or not? Scrooge lay in this state until the chime had gone three quarters more, when he remembered on a sudden that the ghost had warned him of a vis visitation when the bell tolled one. He resolved to lie awake until the hour was past, and considering that he could no more go to sleep than go to heaven, this was perhaps the wisest resolution in his power. The quarter was so long that he was more than once convinced he must have sunk into a doze unconsciously, and missed the clock. At length it broke upon his listening ear. Ding dong! A quarter past, said Scrooge, counting. Ding dong! Half past, said Scrooge. Ding dong! A quarter to it, said Scrooge. Ding dong! The hour itself, said Scrooge triumphantly, and nothing else. He spoke before the hour bell sounded, which it now did with a deep, dull, hollow melancholy. One. Light flashed up in the room upon the instant, and the curtains of his bed were drawn. The curtains of his bed were drawn aside, I tell you, by a hand. Not the curtains of his feet, nor the curtains of his back, but those to which his face was addressed. Curtains of his bed were drawn aside, and Scrooge, starting up into a half-recumbent attitude, found himself face to face with the unearthly visitor who drew them, as close as it is to you, as close as it as it is, as I, as close as it as I am now to you, and I am standing the spirit at your elbow. It was a strange figure, like a child, yet not so like a child as like an old man viewed through some supernatural medium which gave him the appearance of having receded from the view and been diminished to a child's proportions. His hair, which hung about its neck and down its back, was white as if with age, yet the face had not a wrinkle on it, and the tenderest bloom was on the skin. The arms were very long and muscular, the hands the same, as if its hold were of uncommon strength. Its legs and feet, most delicately formed, were, like those upper members, bare. It wore a tunic of the purest white, and round its waist was bound a lustrous belt, the sheen of which was beautiful. It held a branch of fresh green holly in its hand, and in singular contradiction of that wintry album, emblem, had its dress trimmed with summer flowers. But the strangest thing about it was that from the crown of its head there sprung a bright, clear jet of light, 
which all this was visible, and which was so doubtful, doubtless the occasion of its using, in its duller moments, a great extinguisher for a cap which it now held under its arm. Even this, though, when Scrooge looked at it with increasing steadiness, was not its strangest quality. For as its belt sparkled and glittered, now in one part and now another, what was light one instant and another time was dark, so the figure itself fluctuated in its distinctness between distinctness being now a thing with one arm, now with one leg, now with twenty legs, now a pair of legs without a head, now a head without a body, at which dissolving parts no outline could be visible in the dense gloom wherein they melted away. And in the very wonder of this, it could be itself again, distinct and clear as ever. Are you the spirit, sir, whose coming was foretold to me? asked Scrooge. I am. The voice was soft and gentle, singularly low, as if instead of being so close beside him, it were at a distance. Who and what are you? Scrooge demanded. I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past, inquired Scrooge, observant of its dwarfish dwarf stature. No, your past. Perhaps Scrooge could have been told anybody, could not have told anybody why, if anybody could have asked him, but he had a special desire to seal the spirit in its cap and begged him to be covered. What, exclaimed the ghost, would you soon put me out with worldly hands, the light I give it? Is it not enough that you know one of those passions made this cap, and forced me through whole trains of years to wear it low upon my brow? Scrooge reverently disclaimed all intentions to offend, or any knowledge of having willfully bonneted the spirit at any period of his life. He then made bold to inquire what business brought him there. Your welfare, said the, said the ghost. Scrooge expressed himself much obliged, but could not help thinking that a night of unbroken rest would have been more conducive to that end. The spirit must have heard him thinking, for it said immediately, A reclamation, then. Take heed. Put out its strong arm as it spoke, and clasped him gently by the arm. Rise and walk with me. It would have been vain, in vain for Scrooge to plead that the weather and the hour were, adapted to were not adapted to pedestrian purposes. That bed was warm and the thermometer a long way below freezing, but he was clad but lightly in his slippers, dressing gown and nightcap, and that he had a ch cold upon him at the time. The grasp, though gentle as a woman's hand, was not to be resisted. He rose, but finding that the spirit made towards the window, clasped his robe in supplication. I am mortal, Scrooge remonstrated, and liable to fall. Bear but a touch of my hand there, said the spirit, laying it upon his heart, and you shall be upheld in more than this. As the word was spoken, they passed through the wall and stood upon an open country road with fields on either, si either side. The city had entirely vanished. Not a vestige of it was to be seen. The darkness and the mist had vanished with it, for it was clear, cold winter day with snow upon the ground. Good heaven, said Scrooge, clasping his hands together as he looked upon him. I was bred in this place. I was a boy here. The spirit gazed upon him mildly. His gentle touch, though it had been light and instantaneous, appeared still present to the old man's sense of feeling. He was conscious of a, th conscious of a thousand odours floating in the air, each one connected with a thousand thoughts and hopes and joys and cares long, long forgotten. Your lip is trembling, said the ghost. What is that upon your cheek? Scrooge muttered with unusual catching in his voice, it was Pimple, and begged the coast to lead him where he would. You recollect the way, inquired the spirit. Remember it, cried Scrooge with fervour. I could walk it blindfold. Strange to have forgotten it for so many years, observed the ghost. Let's go on. They walked upon the road, Scrooge recognising every gate and post and tree, until a little market town appeared in the distance with its bridge, its church and winding river. Some shaggy ponies now were seen trotting towards them, with boys upon their backs, who were called to other boys in country gigs and carts driven by farmers. All these boys were in great spirits and shouted to each other, until the broad fields were so full of merry music that the crisp air laughed to hear it. These are but shadows of the things that have been, said the ghost. They have no consciousness of us. Jockin' travellers came on, and as they came, Scrooge knew and named them every one. Why was he, he rejoiced, beyond all bounds to see them? Why did his cold eye glisten and his heart leap up as they went past? Why was he filled with gladness when he heard them give each other Merry Christmas as they parted at crossroads and byways for their several homes? 
What was Merry Christmas to Scrooge? Hard upon Merry Christmas. What good had it ever done to him? The school is not quite deserted, said the ghost. A solitary child, neglected by his friends, is left there still. Scrooge said he knew it. Then he sobbed. He left the high road by a well-remembered lane and soon approached a mansion of dull red brick with a little weathercock surmounted cupola on the roof and a bell hanging in it. It was a large house, but one of broken fortunes, for the spacious offices were little used. Their walls were damp and mossy, their windows broken, and their gates decayed. Fowls clipped and strutted in the, sta in the stables, and the coach houses and sheds were overrun with grass. Nor was it more retentive of its ancient state within, for entertaining the entering the dreary halls and glancing through the open doors of many rooms, he found them poorly furnished, cold and vast. There was an earthy savour in the air, a chilly bareness in the place, which associated itself somehow with too much getting up by candlelight, and not enough to eat. They went, the ghost and Scrooge, across the hall to a door at the back of the house. It opened before them and disclosed a long, bare, melancholy room, made much barer by the light lines of plain deal forms and desks. At one of these, a lonely boy was reading near a feeble fire, and Scrooge sat down upon a form and wept to see his form of forgotten self as he used to be. Not a latent echo in the house, not a squeak and scuffle from the mice behind the panelling, not a drip from the half-thawed water spout in the dull yard behind, not the sigh upon the leafless bowers of one despondent poplar, not the idle swinging of an empty storehouse door. No, not a clicking in the fire, but fell upon the heart of Scrooge with a softening influence and gave a freer passage to his tears. The spirit touched him on the arm and pointed to his younger self, a tense upon his reading. Suddenly a man in foreign garments, wonderfully real and distinct to look at, stood outside the window with an axe stuck in his belt, and le leaning by the bridle an ass laden with wood. Why, it's Ali Baba, Scrooge, Scrooge, Scrooge exclaimed in ecstasy. It's dear old honest Ali Baba. Yes, yes, I know. One Christmas time, when yonder solitary child was left here all alone, he did come for the first time, just like that. Poor boy. And Valentine, said Scrooge, and his wild brother, Orson. There they go. And what's his name, who was put down in his, in his, in his drawers, asleep at the gate of Damascus? Don't you see him? And the Sultan's groom, turned upside down by the genie. There he is, upon his head. Serve him right. I'm glad of it. What business had he to be married to the princess? To hear Scrooge expanding all the earnestness of his nature on such subjects, in the most extraordinary voice between laughing and crying, and to see his heightened and excited face, would have been a surprise to his business friends in the city indeed. There's the parrot, cried Scrooge, green body and yellow tail with a thing like a lettuce growing out the top of his head. There he is! Poor Robin Crusoe, he called him when he came home after his sailing round the island. Poor Robin Crusoe, where have you been, Robin Crusoe? The man thought he was dreaming, but he wasn't. It was the parrot, you know. There goes Friday, running for his life to the little creek. Halloa! Hoop! Hello! Then, with a rapid of transition very foreign to his usual character, he said, in pity of his former self, Poor boy! And cried again. I wish, Scrooge muttered, putting his hand in his pocket and looking about him after drying his eyes with his cuff. But it's too late now. What's the matter? asked the spirit. Nothing, said Scrooge. Nothing. There was a boy singing Christmas carol at my door last night. I should like to have given him something. That's all. The ghost smiled thoughtfully and waved its hand, saying as it did so, Let's see another Christmas. Scrooge's former self grew larger at the words, and the groom became a little darker and more dirty. The panels shrunk, the windows cracked, fragments of plaster fell out of the ceiling, and the naked laths were shown instead. But how all this was brought about, Scrooge knew no more, more than you do. He only knew that it was quite correct, that everything had happened so, that there he was alone again, and all the other boys had gone home for the jolly holidays. He was not reading now, but walking up and down despairingly. Scrooge looked at the ghost with mourning, mournful shaking of his head, glanced anxiously towards the door. It opened, and a little girl much younger than the boy came darting in, and putting her arms about his neck and often kissing him, addressed him as her dear, dear brother. I've come to bring you home, dear brother, said the child, clapping her tiny hands and bending down to laugh. To bring you home, home, home. 
Home, little fan, returned the boy. Yes, said the child, brimful of glee. Home for good and all. Home forever and ever. Father is much kinder than he used to be. That's home. That home's like heaven. He spoke so gently to me one dear night when I was going to bed. There was not afraid to ask him once more if he might come home. And he said, yes, you should. And send me in a coach to bring you. And you're to be a man, said the child, opening her eyes. And are never to come back here. The first were to be gathered all the Christmas long and have the merriest time in all the world. You're quite a woman, little fan, explained the boy. She clapped her hands and laughed and tried to touch his head, but being too little, laughed again and stood on tiptoe to embrace him. Then she began to drag him in her childish e eagerness towards the door, and he, nothing loath to go, accompanied her. A terrible voice in the hall cried, Ring down Master Scrooge's box there! And in the hall appeared the schoolmaster himself, who glared on Master Scrooge with a ferocious condescension and threw him into a dreadful state of mind by shaking hands with him. He then conveyed him and his sister into the veriest old well of a shivering best parlour that he was that was ever to be seen, where the maps upon the wall and the celestial and terrestrial globes in the windows were waxy with cold. He, he produced a decanter of curiously light wine and a block of curiously heavy cake and administered instalments of those dainties to the young people, at the same time sending out a meagre servant to offer a glass of something to the postboy, who answered that he thanked the gentleman, but if it wasn't all the same, uh, it was the same uh, as of the same tap as he had tasted before, he'd rather not. Master Scrooge's trunk, being thus the time tied on the top of the chairs, the children bade the schoolmaster goodbye right willingly, and getting into it drove gaily down the garden sweep quick wheels dashing the hoar-frost and snow from the dark leaves of the evergreens like spray. Always a delicate creature, whom her breath might have withered, said the ghost. But she had a large heart. So she had, cried Scrooge. You're right. I will not gainsay it, spirit. God forbid. She died a woman, said the ghost, and had, as I think, children. One child, Scrooge returned. Two, said the ghost. Your nephew, Scrooge seemed uneasy in his mind and answered briefly, Yes. Although they had but that moment left the school behind them, they were now in the busy thoroughfares of a city where shadowy passengers paused and repassed, where shadowy carts and coaches battled for the way, and all the strife and tumult of a real city were. It was made plain enough by the dressing of the shops, and here too was Christmas time again. But it was evening, and the streets were lighted up. The ghost stopped at a certain warehouse door and asked Scrooge if he knew it. Know it, said Scrooge. I was apprenticed here. They went in, at the sight of an old gentleman in a Welsh wig sitting behind such a high desk that if he had been two inches tall he must have knocked his head upon the ceiling. Scrooge cried out in great excitement, Why, it's old Fezziwig. Bless his heart, it's Fezziwig alive again. Old Fezziwig laid down his peg, laid down his pen, and looked up at the clock, which pointed the hour of seven. He rubbed his hands, adjusted his capacious waistcoat, laughed all over himself from his shows to his organ of bene from his shows to his organ of benevolence, and called out in a comfortable, oily, rich, fat, jovial voice, "Yo ho there, Ebenezer, Dick!" Scrooge's former self, now grown a young man, came briskly in, accompanied by his fellow apprentice. "Dick Wilkins, to be sure," said Scrooge to the ghost. Bless me, yes, there he is. He was very much attached to me, was Dick. Poor Dick. Dear, dear. Yo-ho, my boys, said Fezziwick. No more work tonight, Chris. No more work tonight. Christmas Eve, Dick. Christmas, Ebenezer. Let's have the shutters up, cried old Fezziwick, with a sharp clap of his hands, before a man can say, Jack Robinson. You wouldn't believe how those fellows went at it. They charged into the street with the shutters, one, two, three, had them up in their places, four, five, six, barred them and pinned them, seven, eight, nine, and came back before he could have got to twelve, panting like racehorses. Hilly ho! cried Fezziwig, skipping down from the high desk with a wonderful agility. Clear away, my lads, let's have lots of room here. Hilly ho, Dick! Cheer up, Ebenezer! Clear away! There was nothing they could have cleared away or couldn't have cleared away with old Fezziwig looking at. Looking on, it was done in a minute. Every movable was packed off as it was dismissed from public life forevermore. The floor was swept and watered, the lamps were trimmed, fuel was heaped upon the fire, and the warehouse was so snug and warm and dry and bright a ballroom as you could have desired to see upon a winter's night. In came a fiddler with a music book and went up to the lofty desk and made an orchestra of it, 
and tuned like fifty stomach aches. In came Mrs. Fezziwig with one, one vast substantial smile. In came the three Miss Fezziwigs, beaming and lovable. In came the six young followers, whose hearts they broke. In came all the young men and women employed in the business. In came the housemaid with her cousin the baker. In came the cook with her brother's particular friend the milkman. In came the boy from over the way who was suspected of not having bored enough from his master, trying to hide himself behind the girl from next door but one who was proved to have had her ears pulled by her mistress. In they all came, one after another, some shyly, some boldly, some gracefully, some awkwardly, some pushing, some pulling. In they all came, anyhow and everyhow. Away they all went, twenty couples at once, hands half round and back again the other way, down the middle and up again, round and round, and various stages of affectionate grouping. Old top couple always turning up in the wrong place, new top couple starting off again as soon as they got there. All top couples at last, and not a bottom one to help them. When the result was brought about, old Fezziwig, clapping his hands to stop the dance, cried out, Well done! And the fiddler plunged his hot face in a port pot of porter, especially provided for that purpose. But scorning rest upon his reappearance, he instantly began again, though there were no dances yet, as if the other fiddler had been carried home exhausted on a shutter, and a brand new man resolved to beat him out of sight or perish. There were more dances, and there were forfeits, and more dances, and there was cake, and there was negus, and there was a great piece of cold roast, and there was a great piece of cold boiled, and there were mince pies and plenty of beer. But the great effect of the evening came after the roast and boiled, when the fiddler, an artful dog, mind you, the sort of man who knew his business better than you or I could have told him, struck up Sir Roger de Coverley. Then old Fezziwig stood out to dance with his Mrs. Fezziwig. Top couple, too, with a good piece of artwork cut out for them, three or four and twenty pair of partners, people who are not to be trifled with, people who could dance, and had no notion of walking. But if they had been twice as many, uh, four times old Fezziwig would have been a match for them, and so would Mrs. Fezziwig. As to her, she was worthy to be his partner in every sense of the term. If that's not high praise, tell me high and I'll use it. A positive light appears to appear to issue from Fezziwig's calves. They shone in every part of the dance like moons. You could have predicted you, you couldn't have predicted at any given time what would have come come of them next. When old Fezziwig and Mrs. Fezziwig had gone all through the dance, advance and retire, both hands to your partner, bow and curtsy, corkscrew, thread the needle and back again to your place, Fezziwig cut cut so deftly that he appeared to wink with his legs and came upon his feet again without a stagger. When the clock struck twelve, this domestic hole broke up. Mr. and Mrs. Fezziwig took their stations, one on another side of the door, and shaking hands with every person individually, as he and she went out, wished them, him or her a Merry Christmas. When everybody had retired but the two apprentices, they did the same to them, and thus the cheerful voices died away, and the lads were left to their beds, which was, were under the counter in the back shop. In the whole of this time, Scrooge had acted like a man out of his wits. His heart and soul were in the scene with his former self. He corroborated everything, remembered everything, enjoyed everything, and underwent the stranger's agi agitation. It was not until now, when the bright faces of his former self and Dick were turned from them, that he remembered the ghost and became conscious that it was looking full upon him, while the light upon its head burnt very clearly. A small matter, said the ghost, to make these silly folks so full of gratitude. Small, echoed Scrooge. The spirit signed to him to listen to the two apprentices who were pouring out their hearts in praise of Fezziwig. When he had done so, he said, Why, is it not? He has spent, spent a few pounds of your mortal money, three or four perhaps. Is that so much that he deserves such praise? It isn't that, said Scrooge, heated by the remark and speaking unconsciously like his former, not his latter self. It isn't that, spirit. He has the power to render us happy, or, unha or unhappy, to make our service light or burdensome, a pleasure or a toil. Say that his power lies in words and looks, in things so slight and insignificant, it's impossible to add and count them up. What then? The happiness he gives is quite as great as if it cost a fortune. He felt the spirit's glance and stopped. What's the matter? asked the ghost. Nothing in particular, said Scrooge. Something, I think. The ghost insisted. No, said Scrooge. No, I should like to be able to say a word or two to my farmer, to my clerk, just now. That's all. 
His former self turned down the lamps, lamps as he gave utterance to the wish, and Scrooge and the ghost again stood side by side in the open air. My time grows short, observed the spirit. Quick! This was not addressed to Scrooge or to any one whom he could see, but it produced an immediate effect, for again Scrooge saw himself. He was older now, a man in the prime of life, whose face had not the harsh and rigid lines of later years, but had begun to wear the signs of care and avarice. There was an eager, greedy, restless motion in the eye which showed the passion that had taken root, and where the shadow of the growing tree would fall. He was not alone, but sat by the side of a fair young girl in a mourning dress, in whose eyes there were tears which sparkled in the light that shone out of the ghost of Christmas past. It matters little, she said softly. To you, very little. Another idol has displaced me, and if it can cheer and comfort you in time to come, as I would have tried to do, I have no just cause to grieve. What idol has displaced you, he rejoined. A golden one. This is the even-handed dealing of the world, he said. There is nothing on which it is so hard as poverty. There is nothing it professes to come down with such severity as the pursuit of wealth. You fear the world too much, she answered gently. All your other hopes have merged into the hope of being beyond the chance of its sordid reproach. I've seen your noble aspirations fall off, one by one, until the master passion, gain, engrosses you. Have I not? What then, he retorted. Even if I've grown so much wiser, what then? I'm not changed towards you. She shook her head. Am I? Our contract is an old one. It was made when we were both poor and content to be so. Until in good season we can prove our worldly fortune by our patient industry. You are changed. When he was made, you were another man. I was a boy, he said impatiently. Your own feelings tell you that you are not what you are now. I am. That which promised happiness when we were one in heart is fraught with misery now that we are two. How often and how keenly I have thought of this, I will not say. It's enough that I have thought of it and can release you. Have I ever sought release? In words, no, never. In what, then? In a changed manner, in an altered spirit, in another atmosphere of life, another hope as its great end and everything that made my love of any worth or value in your sight. For this had never been between us, said the girl, looking mildly but with steadiness, steadiness upon him. Tell me, would you seek me out and try to win me now? Ah, uh, no. He seemed to yield to the justice of this supposition, in spite of himself, but he said with a struggle, You think not? I would gladly think otherwise if I could, she answered. Heaven knows, when I have learned the truth like this, I know how strong and irresistible it must be. If we're free today, tomorrow, yesterday, can I even can even I believe that you would choose a dowerless girl, you who in your very every confidence with her weigh everything by gain, or choosing her if for a, if for a moment you were false enough to your one guiding principle to do so, do I not know that your rep repentance and regret would surely follow? I do, and I release you with a full heart for the love of him you once were. He was about to speak, but with her head turned from him she res resumed. You may, the memory of what is past and past makes me hope you will, have pain in this. A very, very brief time, and you will dismiss the recollection of it, gladly as an unprofitable dream from which it happened well that you awoke. You may be happy in the life you have chosen. She left him, and they parted. Spirit, said Scrooge, show me no more, conduct me home. Why do you delight to torture me? One shadow more, exclaimed the ghost. No more, cried Scrooge, no more. I don't wish to see it. Show me no more. But the relentless ghost pinioned him in both his arms and forced him to observe what happened next. They were in another scene and place, a room not very large or handsome but full of comfort. Near to the winter fire sat a beautiful young girl, so like that last that Scrooge believed it was the same, until he saw her now a comely matron sitting opposite her daughter. The noise in this room was perfectly tumultuous, for there were more children there than Scrooge in his agitated state of mind could count, and like the celebrated herd in the poem, there were not forty children conducting themselves like one, but every child was conducting himself like forty. Consequences were uproarious beyond belief. 
No one seemed to care. On the contrary, the mother and daughter laughed heartily and enjoyed it very much, and the latter, soon beginning to mingle in the sports, got pillaged by the young brigands most ruthlessly. What could I have not have given to be one of them? Oh, I never could have been so, so rude. No, no, I wouldn't for the wealth of all the world have crushed that braided hair and torn it down for the precious little shoe. I wouldn't have plucked it off. God bless my soul to save my life. As to measuring her waist and sport as they did, bold young brood, I couldn't have done it. I should have expected my arm to have grown round it for punishment and never come straight again. Yet I should have dearly liked, I own, to have touched her lips, to have questioned her, that she might have opened them, to have looked upon the lashes of her downcast eyes and never raised a blush, to have let loose waves of hair and into, into which would be a keepsake beyond price. In short, I should have liked, I do confess, to have had the lightest license of a child, yet to have been man enough to know its value. When our knocking at the door was heard, and such a rush immediately ensued, ensued that she was laughing face and plundered dress was borne towards it. At the centre of a flushed and boisterous group, group, just in time to greet the father, who came home attended by a man laden with Christmas toys and presents. Then the shouting and the struggling and the onslaught that was made on the defenceless porter, the scaling him with chairs for ladders to dive into his pockets, to spoil him of brown paste paper parcels, hold on tight by his cravat, hug him round his neck, pummel his back and kick his legs in irrepressible, irrepressible affection. The shouts of wonder and delight with which the development of every package was received. The terrible announcement that the baby, baby, baby had been taken in the act of putting a doll's frying pan into its mouth was more than suspected of having swallowed a fictitious turkey glued on a wooden, wooden platter. The immense relief of finding this a false alarm. The joy and gratitude and ecstasy. They are all indescribable alike. It's enough that by degrees the children and their emotions got out of the parlour by one stair at a time up to the top of the house where they went to bed, and so subsided. And how Scrooge looked on more attent attentively than ever when the master of the house, having his daughter leaning fondly on him, sat down with her and her mother at his own fireside. Only thought that such another creature, quite as grateful and as full of promise, might have called him father, and been a springtime in the haggard winter of his life. His sight grew very dim indeed. Bell, said the husband, turning to his wife with a smile, I saw an old friend of yours this afternoon. Who was it? Guess. How can I? T t I don't know, she added in the same breath, laughing as she laughed. Mr. Scrooge? Mr. Scrooge it was. I passed his office window, and as it was not shut up, and he had a candle inside, I could barely help seeing him. His partner lies upon the point of death, I hear. And there he sat, alone. Quite alone in the world, I do believe. Spirit said Scrooge in a broken voice. Remove me from this place. I told you these were the shadows of the things that have been, said the ghost. If they are what they are, do not blame me. Remove me, Scrooge exclaimed. I can't bear it. He turned upon the ghost, and seeing that it looked upon him with a face, which some strange way there were fragments of all faces that had shown him, wrestled with it. Leave me, take me back, haunt me no longer. In a struggle, if that could be called a struggle, in which the ghost, with no visible resistance on its own part, was undisturbed by an effort, any effort of its adversary, Scrooge observed that its light was burning high and bright, and dimly connecting that with, his, with its influence over him, he seized the extinguisher cap, by a sudden action pressed it down upon its head. The spirit dropped beneath it, so that the extinguisher covered its whole form. But though Scrooge pressed it down with all his force, he could not hide the light, which streamed from under it in an unbroken flood upon the ground. He was conscious of being exhausted and overcome by an irresistible, irresistible drowsiness, and further of being in his own bedroom. He gave the cap a parting squeeze, which his hand relaxed, and had barely time to reel to bed before he sank into a deep, steep sleep. And that is the end of Stave 2. Stay tuned for next week's th in thrilling instalment, next week's instalment of Christmas Carol. Thank you for listening. Bye bye for now.